reported $275 million with a value of $262.5 million. Free agency million. is one of the most high stakes periods of the year. With moves that can define franchises and derail playoff $100 hopes. $100 million. Dollars. And what did Daniel Snyder get? Absolutely nothing. But amidst the $100 million contracts, a dark side would emerge. Let me get right to it. Running backs are getting screwed over by the National Football League. Le'Veon Bell is being incredibly betrayed by the Pittsburgh Steelers as an organization. Want me to show you my worth? Want to show you how much how valuable I am to the team? I won't show up. I won't play it down. The day before free agency began, the NFL fined the Washington Redskins $36 million against the cap. It fined the Dallas Cowboys $10 million against the cap. It has suspended Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross and fined him $1.5 million for, quote, tampering with Tom and Sean Payton. The New York Jets are reportedly being investigated for possible foul play in their pursuit of cornerback Darrell Revis. Our players are sacrificing real things in order to advance their families and their brothers. Our battles with the owners are serious. They are at times epic. And if that means ruthlessly treating the owners the way that they treat us, we will never shy away from the fight. The NFL's free agency system makes for a thrilling few weeks each year. $120 million. $84 million fully guaranteed contract. He will continue Just before the spring game. season rolls around. By this point, the Super Bowl champion has been decided, and 31 teams begin their plans to inch closer to lifting the Lombardi the following year. Roster management has become a key component of that, with the salary cap being introduced in 1994, just one year after the free agency period as we know it today. Its mere existence means teams have to think twice about paying their franchise quarterback $50 million per season, because that contract would likely mean losing a couple of key players in other areas of the roster. It works for the league. But the brutality of free agency and the NFL salary cap is a harsh reality. Originally, the NFL adapted a free agency system that mirrored that of Major League Baseball. In 1947, that evolved into a one-year system, whereby a team was only able to renew a player's contract by one year. And that was how it remained until the Roselle Rule was introduced in 1963. The new rule meant that Commissioner Pete Roselle would be able to award compensation, from the team signing a player to the team they signed him from, if no compensation had been agreed prior. Eventually, it came to light that the rule was completely illegal, and thus, it was abolished in 1976. The compensation rule remained, but Roselle's authority in designating the value was revoked. Further disagreements led to a player strike in 1987, and they sued the league again two years later in 1989. At that point, the NFL was forced into action, and between 1989 and 1992, they used a system called the Plan B Free Agency System. This system was deemed illegal too in 1992, and the free agency system as we know it today was introduced. Giving world of the NFL, players are not just athletes, they are pawns in a high stakes game of strategy and ambition. A player's life can be upended in an instant with a single phone call, summoned to the head coach's office where his fate hangs in the balance. Within hours, he'll be expected to uproot his family and pull his children out of school. Players have found ways around this on occasion, perhaps most famously when Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski was on the verge of being traded to the Detroit Lions. He responded by saying he was retiring, forcing the Lions to back out of the trade, and then stayed in New England for several more years. I actually traded to the Detroit Lions. You just traded me to the Lions, I go, oh, I'm retired, like I don't know how that trade can go through, and then two days later, the trade never went through. Can you believe that doesn't happen often though. Largely, players are left devastated, saying goodbye to their teammates in order to go and battle with a new group within the space of 24 hours. 
In the high stakes world of NFL free agency, players finally have a chance to take control of their destinies. They have the power to choose where they play, but just when it seems like players have finally found their perfect fit, there's a catch, a wrinkle in the system that threatens to upend their plans. The Franchise Tag a tool wielded by teams to retain their star players, regardless of their desires or intentions. For every player hoping to chart their own course, there's a team ready to pull them back into the fold. Over the years, the franchise tag has sparked numerous feuds and disputes between players and their teams, leaving a sour taste in the mouths of those who feel shackled by its constraints. While the franchise tag may serve as a strategic tool for teams to retain key players, its impact on player morale and autonomy cannot be ignored. One of the NFL's biggest stars is threatening to quit. Did you win or lose by holding out? The plight of the running back has become a focal point of debate. For running backs like Le'Veon Bell, the franchise tag represents a double-edged sword, a tool wielded by teams to control player movement while simultaneously limiting their earning potential. The franchise tag is like being stuck in purgatory. You're locked in for another year, with no long-term security and the constant fear of injury hanging over your head. Running backs are the workhorses of the NFL, but their careers are often cut short by injury. The franchise tag only exacerbates this problem, leaving players vulnerable and undervalued. The cautionary tales of Todd Gurley and Ezekiel Elliott serve as stark reminders of the risks associated with lucrative, long-term contracts in the NFL. They now have officially released Todd Gurley's Cowboys are releasing Ezekiel Elliott. With the running back position becoming increasingly disposable in the eyes of NFL teams, players are left grappling with the harsh realities of a league that prioritizes profit over player welfare. Many players have seen their last NFL contracts when March rolls around. Teams need to make way for new players and clear space on the roster for their future draft picks. That means a lot of phone calls in March to tell players they're being fired. It's a cutthroat business and one that the players know they're signing up for. Most players earn limited money in the league with an average career spanning just over three seasons. That's less than a rookie deal, which many won't even see all the way through. First You're rounders do okay, like but in the case of some Somebody like Tony Pollard, the $3 million a player of his caliber in the mid rounds of the draft earns might be the only deal he ever gets in the league. In the week of free agency, again, it's the mega deals that catch our attention. Every year a handful of players cash in during the free agency period, having played extremely well and been allowed to leave by their previous team due to a lack of cap space or perhaps a team that's rebuilding. So instead, these players get to test the open market and some will have a host of franchises scrambling for their services. Big deals are all we hear about, but for many, those scrambling for a roster spot, the deals are insignificant, with very limited guaranteed money and a heavy amount of risk. Every year, hundreds of players sign for league minimum deals, praying for a breakout season that might net them a greater return further down the line. And for many of those players, that day never comes. It's a crazy system, and one that certainly favors the franchise owners, and every team in the league is looking for a way to manipulate free agency and the league's salary cap. In an attempt to gain a competitive advantage, often the rules can be bent and twisted, and the franchise tag certainly feels like an extension of that, but there's been numerous occasions where teams have found their own loopholes. In the NFL, one name stands above all others, a legend whose influence transcends the boundaries of the gridiron. His name? Tom Brady. As a quarterback, the most expensive position on the field, he holds immense power over the team's salary cap, capable of single-handedly shaping the destiny of a franchise. Yet in a move that defied convention, Brady chose to sacrifice personal game for the greater good of the team. By reducing his own cap hit and restructuring his contracts, he enabled the New England Patriots to address other needs and build championship winning rosters year after year. What Tom Brady did was unprecedented. He gave up at least 60 million in potential earnings, all in the name of winning. It's a level of selflessness that's rarely seen in professional sports. And win they did. Under Brady's command, the Patriots secured six Super Bowl rings. But Brady's actions also highlighted a broader truth about the NFL, a league where teams constantly push the limits of the salary cap, often towing the line between innovation and exploitation. From backloaded contracts to creative accounting techniques, franchises have long sought ways to maximize their spending power while staying within the confines of the rules comes this news from 
the league. The NFL announcing today they are reducing the Redskins salary cap limit by $36 million, a penalty for overspending by the Skins in the uncapped year of 2012. Dallas Cowboys also suffering the same fate to the tune of $10 million. In March of 2012, the NFL was rocked by a scandal as two of its most storied franchises faced severe repercussions for violating the league's unwritten code of conduct. The Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys found themselves at the center of the controversy, accused of flagrant disregard for integrity of the game. The saga began in 2010, as the collective bargaining agreement teetered on the brink of expiration. With uncertainty looming, the league issued a stern warning to teams, do not exploit the upcoming uncapped season by dumping contracts or front-loading deals. But Jerry Jones Cowboys and Dan Snyder's Redskins chose to defy convention, ignoring the league's admonitions. They embarked on a path of financial manipulation, seeking to gain an unfair advantage in the absence of a salary cap. While neither team was officially found guilty of breaking the rules, the league condemned their actions as a betrayal of the principles that underpin competitive balance. In the eyes of the NFL, they had crossed the line, one that threatened the very foundation of the sport. The consequences were swift and severe. In a historic move, the league docked the Redskins $36 million and the Cowboys $10 million in salary cap space. A punishment designed to send a clear message to all franchises. The line between fair play and foul play is often blurred, a reality that has left many teams entangled in the web of tampering allegations. As players approach the end of their contracts, whispers of backroom deals and secret negotiations swirl through the air, casting a shadow over the integrity of the game. It's a game of cat and mouse, where personal relationships and mutual acquaintances often blur the lines of professional conduct. Coaches, agents, and general managers rub shoulders at events like the Pro Bowl and NFL Honors. In engaging in conversations that could shape the landscape of free agency. But while tampering may be a gray area for some, there are moments when the line is crystal clear, a truth that becomes painfully evident when a player openly admits his wrongdoing. In early 2013, pending free agent wide receiver and return specialist Josh Cribbs was asked about the upcoming free agency market. He replied by saying, My agent has been meeting with several different teams. There's a lot of interest. There are already numbers brought to the table. Things are happening. Wheels are turning behind closed doors. That's the standard procedure for a free agent. The only problem there is that Josh Cribbs was not a free agent yet. The market hadn't opened, and what he had described was a blatant violation of NFL protocol. The the trouble is, free agency is a chaotic time, and the NFL is largely aware that illegal tampering happens all the time. It's near impossible to catch teams doing it, but if you think they're not bending the rules in order to gain an advantage over their franchises, you'd be completely wrong. The fact that Josh Cribbs said his agent had met with several teams shows that teams are pretty willing to extend beyond the rules, and it's not just one team doing it. Few free agents have commanded as much attention and speculation as Tom Brady. The mere mention of his impending free agency sent shockwaves through the league. But as the countdown to free agency began, whispers of tampering allegations cast a shadow over Brady's highly anticipated decision. For one team, the Miami Dolphins, those whispers would soon erupt into a full-blown scandal one that threatened to tarnish the integrity of the game. The Dolphins found themselves embroiled in controversy when former head coach Brian Flores filed a dispute over racial allegations surrounding his firing. What began as a routine investigation soon unearthed evidence of tampering involving none other than Tom Brady. The investigation revealed a pattern of communication between the Dolphins and Brady dating back to August 2019. A clear violation of NFL protocol, despite the league's strict regulations against tampering, the Dolphins had brazenly pursued Brady's services, undeterred by the potential consequences. For six months, the NFL delved into the depths of the Dolphins' actions, uncovering a web of deceit and manipulation. From secret meetings to covert negotiations, it became clear that the pursuit of Brady had consumed the Dolphins' organization, blinding them to the rules that govern fair play. When the truth finally came to light, the Dolphins were left to reckon with the fallout of their actions. Fines, loss of draft picks, and a tarnished reputation. Even the most esteemed franchises can find themselves ensnared in tampering allegations. Such was the case for the Kansas City Chiefs, whose pursuit of wide receiver Jeremy Macklin would ultimately lead to harsh penalties. Macklin, fresh off a career-defining season with the Philadelphia Eagles, found himself at the center of a tampering scandal as he prepared to test the waters of free agency, with Andy Reid, his former head coach in Philadelphia, now at the helm of the Chiefs, 
speculation ran rampant about a potential reunion. But the league's investigation revealed a troubling truth. The Chiefs had violated tampering rules by directly contacting Macklin, circumventing the proper channels of communication through his agent. Despite the gray area surrounding such practices, the NFL wasted no time in meting out punishment. By the time the league handed down its punishment, Macklin had already signed with the Chiefs, a fact that only exacerbated the situation. Andy Reid was fined $75,000, general manager John Dorsey fined $25,000, and the Chiefs organization, but the repercussions didn't end there. The Chiefs were hit with a staggering $250,000 fine as a franchise, and had both their 2016 third round draft pick and 2017 sixth round draft pick stripped from them. A harsh reminder of the cost of breaking the rules in pursuit of talent. Few cases have garnered as much attention as the saga surrounding star cornerback Darrell Revis in his tumultuous journey back to the New York Jets. With accusations flying and tensions running high, the league found itself embroiled in yet another tampering scandal. Revis, a four-time first-team All-Pro, had established himself as one of the premier cornerbacks in the league, a defensive stalwart whose skills were coveted by teams across the NFL. But it was his return to the Jets, the team where he began his illustrious career, that would ignite controversy and allegations of tampering. The Jets' tampering violation came to light following comments made by team owner Woody Johnson, who expressed his desire to see Revis return to the fold. While Johnson later claimed to have misspoken and assured Patriots owner Robert Kraft that he would not interfere in player contracts, the damage had been done. Kraft's own remarks at the NFL annual meeting only fueled the flames as he lamented Revis's departure from the Patriots and expressed a desire for him to stay. The Jets sensing foul play filed allegations of tampering against their AFC East rivals, a move that would set the stage for a contentious showdown. Following an investigation, the league opted not to punish the Patriots, but fined Johnson and the Jets $100,000 for their indiscretions and the toll that the game takes on their bodies. As such, it's only natural that they would seek to maximize their earnings during their brief and precarious careers. A reality that players like Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray know all too well. As they navigate the treacherous waters of contract negotiations, they as the Ravens face the prospect of making difficult roster decisions to accommodate Jackson's hefty contract. Similarly, Kyler Murray's contract with the Arizona Cardinals has become a point of contention for the franchise. It's hindered their ability to build a competitive roster and contend for championships. The contracts of players like Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray serve as a stark reminder of the inherent inequities of the NFL's salary cap system. While players strive to maximize their earnings and secure their financial futures, the consequences of these deals can be felt throughout the organization, affecting everything from roster construction to team success on the field. Few events have had as profound an impact on the landscape of professional football as the landmark antitrust trial of 1992, a trial that would forever alter the trajectory of free agency in the league. At the center of this legal battle were four players who dared to challenge the NFL's restrictive Plan B free agency system, paving the way for the new era of player empowerment. Keith Jackson, Webster Slaughter, DJ Dozier, and Garen Varis, four talented athletes with the support of their legal team, took their case to the United States District Court, where they argued that the NFL's restrictive practices constituted a violation of antitrust laws. After months of legal wrangling and deliberation, the players were granted a temporary restraining order by the presiding judge, allowing them to pursue contracts with any of the league's 28 teams. It was a stunning victory, one that sent shockwaves through the NFL and signaled the dawn of a new era of player empowerment. Yet even as players celebrated their newfound freedom, the specter of labor disputes loomed large on the horizon. The 2011 lockout sparked by disagreements between players and owners over revenue sharing and labor rights served as a reminder of the ongoing struggles for equity and fairness in the NFL. At the heart of the dispute were a litany of concerns raised by the players, who felt increasingly marginalized and undervalued by team owners. From issues of player safety and health benefits to disputes over revenue sharing and rookie salaries, the players made it clear that they were no longer willing to accept the status quo. Yet despite months of negotiations and mediation, the two sides remained deadlocked, unable to find common ground on key issues. With tensions reaching a boiling point, the NFL team owners made the drastic decision to lock out the players, bringing the league to a grinding halt and plunging football fans into uncertainty. 
For months, the NFL remained in a state of limbo, as players and owners engaged in a bitter battle of wills behind closed doors. But ultimately, it was the players who emerged victorious, securing a host of concessions and improvements to their working conditions. The new collective bargaining agreement, reached on July 25th, 2011, represented a seismic shift in the balance of power within the league. Players won 1 billion in additional benefits for retired players, along with enhanced health and safety measures and increased minimum salaries. But perhaps Perhaps most significantly, the lockout paved the way for a more equitable and player-friendly NFL. With improved free agency guidelines, expanded rosters, and a renewed focus on player safety and welfare. Despite their hard-fought victories in the 2011 lockout, players still find themselves at the mercy of franchise control, subject to rules and regulations that often prioritize the interest of team ownership over their own. From the franchise tag to the fifth-year option, players continue to be shackled by restrictive measures that limit their freedom and dictate their futures. Too often, they are treated as commodities, to be traded and discarded at the whim of team management, a reality that underscores the stark power imbalance between players and owners. Players have to do everything they can to fight back against the system that is so heavily bent against them. In the NFL's illustrious history, few names shine as brightly as that of Jerry Rice, a living legend whose unmatched achievements on the gridiron have earned him a place among the all-time greats. But even the most revered icons of the game are not immune to the harsh realities of the NFL's business-driven ethos. At the age of 38, after years of unparalleled success with the San Francisco 49ers, Jerry Rice found himself facing an uncertain future. Despite his storied legacy and undeniable contributions to the franchise, the 49ers were forced to make a difficult decision in order to comply with the constraints of the salary cap. With the team eager to free up cap space and make room for younger talent, they approached Rice with an offer. Retire gracefully and have his contract wiped from their books, or accept a million dollar payout to walk away. But for Rice, the fire still burned within him, and he refused to hang up his cleats just yet. Instead, he found a new home with the Oakland Raiders, a team willing to embrace his veteran leadership and unparalleled skill set. In Oakland, Rice continued to defy father time, adding to his already illustrious legacy with a series of impressive performances on the field. But beyond the accolades and the statistics, Rice's defiance represented something more, a symbolic act of defiance against a league that too often prioritizes profit over people. In 2006, whispers of retirement began to swirl around Brett Favre, prompting speculation and uncertainty among Packer fans. Despite the adoration of the faithful at Soldier Field, a rare display of respect from bitter rivals, the decision to hang up his cleats proved elusive for the gunslinger from Mississippi. As the 2000 season drew to a close, the retirement conversation once again reared its head, casting a shadow over Favre's future with the Packers. With the emergence of a promising young quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, waiting in the wings, Green Bay sought clarity from their aging superstar, requesting a definitive decision by early March. On March 8, 2008, the inevitable announcement came. Brett Favre was retiring from the game he loved. Leaving his reinstatement granted by Commissioner Roger Goodell, Favre seized the opportunity to author a new chapter in his storied career, this time with the New York Jets. And though his time in New York was brief, it was merely a prelude to the ultimate act of redemption, a triumphant return to the NFC North, this time donning the purple and gold of the Minnesota Vikings. In a series of electrifying showdowns against his former team, Favre silenced his critics and cemented his place in football lore, leading the Vikings to victory over the Packers, not once, but twice. Twice, a poetic twist of fate that served as the ultimate vindication for the embattled quarterback. 